to the annual regional science policy and practice uh, keynote lecture. Let me start by reminding you that regional science policy and practice is one of the official journals of the Regional Science Association International. We publish high quality papers in applied regional science that explore policy and practice issues in regional and local development. We are particularly interested in papers targeting at informing the policy development process and papers that lead to the formation of theoretically grounded regional uh, policy. We welcome papers from a range of academic disciplines and practitioners, including planning, public policy, geography, economics, uh, environmental science, and related fields. But without any further ado, let me please introduce you to this here uh, regional science policy and practice keynote speaker. Professor Tom Brockel. Tom is a professor in digital innovation at the University of uh, Stavanger Business School. Before that, he worked at the University of Utrecht, uh, the Leibniz University of Hanover, and the Max Planck Institute of Economics in Jena. His research concentrates on digital innovation processes, knowledge networks, R&D policies, and the relationship between renewable energies as well as media with regional development. He has been publishing in many of the leading journals in the field of economic geography and regional science, including uh, research policy, journal of economic geography, economic geography, but also more technical journals uh, such as PLOS, PLOS One. Currently, he's participating in projects supported by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research and the EU Framework Program for Research and Innovation. So I'm very glad to uh, ask uh, Tom to take the floor. Tom is going to uh, talk for the next 30-35 uh, minutes, uh, presenting a paper which is called Did You See the News? Linking Local News and Regional Development. Uh, I will kindly ask you to post any questions you might have on the uh, uh, chat function, and we'll be able to kick up uh, to kick uh, a discussion after uh, Tom's uh, uh, presentation. Tom, the floor is, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel, for these very, very kind words. And since I only have 35 minutes, I really want to start directly by starting to share the screen and um, that should be on right now. So as was already mentioned, the presentation today is entitled, Did You See the News? Link linking Local News and Regional Development. And as has become clear from the presentation of my CV, I'm actually not, I haven't done that much work on the media side, so to speak, um, in the past. Rather, I have been concentrating and focusing on working on innovation related topics. So how come that I, that I went to this kind of topic? How did I came about this topic? It was actually by, as an empirical researcher, we were always keen on finding new data sources, something to work with, something to explore. And there I noticed uh, at a certain point in time that there's a rich data set on news or that news generally represents a very rich data set. So I started exploring that. And while doing that, I realized there's much more to it. And this keynote presentation is very much about outlining what I believe is an interesting research topic to be explored much more so than what has been done in the past. So let's get started. Of course, if we talk about these type of topics, we know that in order to have a rich understanding of regional development, we have to look at people's behavior. Right In the end, whatever we see out there is the result or the consequence of people's behavior. And this behavioral view on economic uh, actors is quite uh, well established, obviously, in regional science, economic geography, and related disciplines. Very famously, already in the, in the 60s, ideas relating to the diffusion and adaption of innovation, as well as the ideas of mental maps. You see some very interesting ones at the bottom of these slides. Uh, built upon the idea that we have to look at really people's behavior, not just structures, um, in order to understand what's going on. Alan Prade famously implemented this type of idea in the behavior location choice series, which I'm pretty sure most of you are very familiar with. 
Today, these, um, these type of research has um, found an, a new home, a new relation in uh, evolutionary economic geography, amongst others. Um, uh, you see the three dots below there. So there's obviously much more. It's a little bit um, a narrow presentation here. But in evolutionary economic geography in particular, uh, rests on the idea of these bounded rational actors. And very much then on the idea that behavior needs to be studied in order to understand, for instance, regional development. And behavior, as we all know, is very much based on the available information and the interpretation, right? So we do and act in specific ways because we have learned something, we have been informed about something, and we have interpreted it in a specific way. But then if you look into the research in our type of field, regional studies, economic geography, you do see that a lot of this research focuses on the information on knowledge of a very specific group of, of actors, of economic actors. We could call them experts or decision makers, right? So if you think back even to the earliest uh, type of research on this type of matter, like by uh, Marshall and, uh, and Jaffe later on in, in the 80s, uh, where the idea of knowledge spillover came up, it was always about knowledge spillovers between experts. For instance, innovat uh, innovators or entrepreneurs or uh, spillovers between academia and the private sector. And we have uh, really uh, invested quite a lot in this type of idea and doing this type of research by studying not only knowledge spillovers, but then also basing concepts around these idea, open innovation ecosystem approaches that very much look into the activities and behavior of economic actors, individuals, but also groups that engage in innovation process or related type of processes. And we have studied this from a network perspective, for instance, looking at firm networks, local, regional firm networks that very much, uh, at least in, in, when it comes to the empirics, are very much based on the perception and data we obtained on the, uh, with respect to managers or engineers, uh, where we know, okay, with whom do they try to interact? What are factors underlying that, what role does, for instance, geographic proximity play and other types of proximity in that respect. We then looked further uh, by looking at interregional connections from where do these type of people source knowledge, where do they bring knowledge to, how does this information and knowledge diffuse in space. And this is great. And I think we have really learned uh, quite a lot there and really made great progress. However, sometimes in some circumstances, Looking only at these type of expert groups or decision makers, I would want to call that, might not be enough. Sometimes we might actually be much more interested in how the regional population behaves, let's say the average inhabitant in a specific locality. And that is very relevant, for instance, if we assess the impact of political and social in initiatives, where we really want to see whether behavioral change on a broader basis takes place in a specific case. Right? I think in economics, it's also very um, much common to look at consumer behavior. You don't want to sell your products to, let's say, just experts. Sometimes you do. But in many cases, you actually want to sell your products to a wider audience. Right? And then it's important to understand their behavior and where do they get the information from. So the question then is, how does the general population, be it in a specific place, be it in a specific organization, so how does does the general population informs itself or is informed? Where does it get the information onto which it can base its behavior? Obviously, it can obtain that from direct experiences, observing certain events, um, seeing things basically happening around them. They do, most of us at least still, I mean, the pandemic is challenging that a little bit, but most of us still do have real social interactions. So we interact with other people, get to talk to them, see what they are doing, learning from them. Then we have this social media where we obtain a lot of information as well. Not always the correct one, but we do get a lot of information there, maybe even information overflow. Uh, and then on top of that, we do have, and I think most of us are very much interested in looking at international and national news, right? A lot of us watch TV, um, watch, um, uh, uh, read newspapers, listen to the radio, something like that. And this is full of news, right? 
But then there is something I think most of us are also quite familiar with, and which I will argue is very interesting to look at from a geographical, from a regional perspective, and that is really regional and local news. So the, if we talk about behavior of the general population in a location, it gets a lot of information through all these different channels, and one of these is also regional and local news. And this will be very much in the center of this presentation. So the first question then is, okay, why should we care? Why should we care about regional news or news if we're primarily interested in economic behavior or the economic consequences of behavior? Well, you've seen these type of wonderful headlines, these type of very um, uh, placative uh, newspaper headlines, cover stories, and a lot of people see that on a daily basis. And the idea is that this may not only pass on certain type of information, but also has some consequences. If we look at that a little more systematically, there are a number of ways in how what is written, for instance, in newspapers, what is presented in news, actually may provide certain information or interpretations thereof to a wider audience. For instance, the newspapers or news, me news media in general makes a selection of what it considers to be newsworthy. So what events are reported about and what are not reported about. It also can present the same event in different ways, rather positively, rather negatively, something that's usually referred to as sentiment. But also framing is very important. So what belongs to a specific topic? What events are covered under the same heading? what things are related to each other. So all this, which most of us as scientists, we're very well aware of, because it's also something to a certain degree, we also have to consider in writing papers. It is of course much bigger in terms of importance when we talk about news media, if we talk about newspapers, TV stations, and so on. So also the ways of how things are presented in general uh, on the front page, for instance, of a newspaper, uh, on the first um, web page, uh, or do you have to look for specific information somewhere below that? So if we think about the functions that news media provides in this contrast, it has been, of course, known for a long time that it expands the information basis, meaning it provides information on specific events. It frames discourses, as I mentioned before, it, rel it relates certain events to each other, it uh, adds certain content to it, certain context as well. And by that, journalists are also human beings. Uh, they interpret, they make interpretations, they have certain attitudes and sentiments concerning certain topics. And if we look into this media research, which has been existing for quite a long time, it turns out that news media or what is, let's say, written in a newspaper, just to make this simple, is particularly, is not always, uh, has, does not always have the same type of relevance. Uh, rather, it becomes particularly relevant when we're talking about complex issues. Take a very recent example, the pandemic, right? How much, how many of us really read these scientific newspapers? I mean, nowadays, I would imagine more so than maybe in the beginning, but in particular, in the beginning, um, we have been presented information, interpretations of this relatively complex issue uh, from newspapers, from watching TV, from the radio, and so on. So whenever issues are relatively complex, and again, here we talk more uh, in the context of a wider population, we turn towards something that synthesizes information that presents it in an easier to assess fashion, and these are news. And this is usually also the case when things are outside our direct observation. So if I can watch the football match myself, I may not read uh, the report afterwards. But if I didn't have the possibility to watch the game, then I will be very, um, I will be highly interested in reading the summary there. Right? So if we can't observe certain things, then we turn towards the news. And generally, at least in the context I'm talking about, this particularly applies to events that tend to be further away in terms of geographic distance. So things we cannot observe, like the outbreak of the pandemic uh, somewhere in Asia. And all this together, all these ways of how information can be presented has been shown to matter economically. So there have been a lot of studies showing that what is reported in the news does correlate with certain uh, employment developments, with general uh, economic output, business cycles, and productivity. 
but even more directly, there are a lot of studies showing that consumer confidence, for instance, is directly influenced and shaped by how things are presented in the news. Stock market prices are very well known to be related to what is reported in the news, for instance, about the company itself, but also about the entire context in which the company operates. Firm reputation, housing prices, and of course, also election results, which then usually have big economic consequences. So there's quite a lot of research existing that shows the economic consequences of news or the economic impact. And this is also the case when we look at the topic I'm um, very interested in, and that is the acceptance and diffusion of innovation and technologies, which is also because in the end, technologies imply that certain products or innovation imply that certain products are brought to the market. So people actually use these things. And in order to use these things, they need to get information and not always do they do so through type of expert channels. In many cases, it is the way new technologies and innovation are presented in the news that shapes the perception and the potential acceptance of that. And there are fantastic case studies looking at, for instance, nuclear technology, food biotechnology, bioenergy, and wind power, which is right now in Norway, a big topic, for instance. So how many onshore wind turbines can be installed here in Norway? What is acceptable from a social perspective? but also from an environmental perspective. And this debate is very much taking place in the news and thereby shaping the perception of the general um, population, which then eventually decides what type of policies will be implemented or what type of people will be elected that implement these policies. However, the question now is, so what? So there already exists a lot of research. So why should we as regional scientists, economic geographers and related disciplines care about that? Well, there are a whole lot of interesting gaps. Most importantly, most of the studies I've just referred to and many more, they focus at the national level. So we do know that differences in the way news reports things, the way uh, differences in the way things are presented in the news, for instance, new technologies, they differ between nations. And there they make a difference. But what about the subnational, regional scale? Isn't there maybe also some variation that is interesting to be explored? And I will come back to that in a second. Also, there's relatively little research on how news then relate to general, let's say, economic regional structural characteristics. So general, the relationship between what is in the news and some other kind, let's say, of output measures. I presented some before, but those are not the, uh, the majority of studies. The majority of studies in that field rather focuses on what's within the news itself. How does it uh, develop over time? Another dimension that is very much in the focus of this type of research. Nowadays, we also see a lot of research that focuses directly on social networks and not so much on professional news, like professional newspapers, TV stations, and so on, and thereby a little bit ignoring that a lot of the content we see on social networks, Twitter, Facebook, and so on, is directly taken from these professional news providers. As in many things, the uh, research is quite US-centered, so it would be interesting to explore Europe a little bit, um, also the economic Dimension is somewhat underdeveloped as uh, particular political scientists and sociologists look at these type of topics. So there is a lot to explain despite what I've presented before. And last but not least, um, also in this literature, at least traditionally, it was very much case study oriented. And only recently we see really new type of empirical uh, approaches emerging, big data to name one of the network analysis a text analysis, these type of things, which in itself are already interesting to explore. But the key point is in particular the first one. So what do we know really about the subnational scale? So and then the question is, why would we expect that there is a subnational or regional dimension to news and potentially its impact? Well, I'll try to summarize this in this a wonderful triangle structure for three particular reasons. The first one being, the regional organization of news itself, or better of the news media. So if you think, for instance, newspapers, right? If you buy a newspaper, most likely this will either be a national newspaper or a newspaper that is dedicated towards a very particular regional uh, area. 
Indeed, most newspapers do have quite precisely defined circulation areas, geographically defined, and in a lot of cases, this is at the subnational level. Also, national newspapers, for instance, do tend to have sections of their newspapers that are dedicated towards the content of specific regions. This goes down sometimes even to the local level. So in a lot of newspapers, you actually find city level information or specific sections dedicated towards a specific locality. So, and this creates automatically a type of regional dimension by meaning that in certain places, you read a specific news outlet uh, at a higher probability than in other places. That's the first factor. The second one is regional variation of news supply and demand. And this is really interesting. If you think about what is presented in the news, well then, as I mentioned before, this is driven by newsworthiness. What type of events are perceived to be important? And what is important in the end here, clear economic, um, clear economic incentives, what will be sold or what makes the media being sold in the end, the newspaper, what makes people turn into a specific newspaper, uh, radio station or TV station. And it has not surprisingly therefore been shown that the media is studying very well what is demanded by their audience, right? They do know quite well what is the audience and what uh, are the preferences and the interests of this audience. And thereby it will also argue or present news in a way that is very much in line with existing opinions. I'll come back to that point later. So if we think about how should a regional dimension or subnational dimension of news emerge from that, we do know that um, human beings do are spatially um, in or have a certain spatial interest. That is, they do have a local interest. They do tend to care more about things that are in close geographic proximity to them than about things that are further away. So from this, one can imagine that there exists or there emerges a regional dimension because people, that is the audience that buys certain news outlets, outlets has the preference for hearing about local events and local news. But there's also another uh, relationship existing in this context, and that is news supply having an impact on the demand. So if you are as a, as a newspaper, for instance, I stick to that example, interested in serving your local uh, audience, then you have to report about local events. But that implies there need to be newsworthy events. And if those are not existent, then you basically have to look elsewhere. Also, um, and this is shown in a lot of uh, increasing number of uh, empirical papers, that indeed this location, so what is happening in a specific region, then is also a visible in the content of news. And as I will argue, and as some of the uh, papers at the national level show quite clearly, news has an influence on the likelihood that certain events or behavior is happening or being observed. So by impacting the likelihood that events take place, that perceptions develop in a certain uh, direction or preferences is, are established, they impact in the end what's happening. And Gartz in 2018 provided a very nice example of that. So um, he did some estimations and found that, for instance, if you find or if the number of articles on, un on the unemployment situation in a specific locality increases by 1.8, which is really not that much, you can see how that impacts people's perception of the true economic situation. So despite all their di potential direct observations and other ways of obtaining this information, just with respect to what's happening and what's presented in the newspapers, changes by up to 30%, depending on which direction the original situation was described. So there is a huge impact. And we see this then, that this variation in what's in the news, uh, is, we can see this also in some early studies on the matter. So one we did in, uh, or actually two years ago already, we looked at how frequently there are potential entrepreneurial events in a region. We utilize press releases, which is a more direct measure of what's happening in a region in terms of potentially newsworthy events, and, see, and found there a striking regional uh, variation in that heterogeneity in that, meaning in certain regions, newspapers, for instance, or other news outlets, have simply more events to choose from than another region. 
We did another study together with Bucho Otskin, who will present tomorrow something very interesting. So I highly recommend the, the session she's in uh, S17. Uh, there we looked at the share of innovation news. So we really looked at newspapers and looked for articles that refer to innovation on new technologies, in this case, across Germany. And then we also found that it varies substantially and systematically between regions. So in some regions, we find much more a higher share of news related to innovation than in other regions, right? So taken together, we see on the one hand, this discrepancy with respect to events in the case of entrepreneurial activities um, that may be perceived by some as news, potentially newsworthy. And on the other hand, we also see um, that what shows up in news has some variation in that uh, regards. So this interplay of demand and supply may create another type of, of features, uh, feeds into this potential regional dimension of news. The last point or the last factor of this triangle is the regional embeddedness of the news media. And here the idea is also quite simple. Journalists and other people that are active in the news media, they are not operating in isolation. They are also human beings and by that uh, means they are part of a region. They do experience local events, which again shape what they will write about. They are themselves maybe exposed to local media. Hopefully they are not reading just their own newspaper or listening to their own radio station, but also look for others that are offered in the place they are located. They are embedded into social networks. And for these, we do know that they do have a quite distinct local uh, dimension, which implies more likely to be exposed to certain preferences, sentiments, but also information. There is a lot of discussion in particular in uh, political science, to what extent the media has a kind of agenda setting ability. So to what extent it has an independent interest to form, to promote certain discourses, um, which is quite established, but the question is to what extent such may exist also at a regional level or subnational level. So in any case, and this is research that shows us also that news that the news media is un, as well as intentionally regionally shaped. So it does have, um, and hereby I mean really the people that work in the media, they do have a regional geographical lens through which they perceive and report about events. But generally, there is relatively little uh, research with respect to these type of arguments at the subnational level. So there is definitely something to look into further, but I think uh, the argument becomes quite clear. And taking all these three factors or dimensions together, I argue that indeed uh, we can expect a quite, re uh, quite strong and pronounced regional dimension in the news be it in newspapers, for instance, or be it in uh, TV stations, radio programs, and so forth. And it's really the combination of these three uh, things that together creates this um, regional dimension. However, I presented this in a very simplified manner. The longer you think about, the more complex the entire process becomes. So it really then becomes what type of event, uh, the question really then becomes what type of events are selected for what reasons to be presented in the news? What is the demand of the audience? How is the interplay between the local news media um, and the local audience? To what extent do non-regional events or events that take place elsewhere compete with local events? Right? So there's quite a lot of uh, selection processes, demand and supply interplay processes in this. And what I show here is just uh, a first take at this process. This might actually be even more complex than shown here. So there is a lot to disentangle. In any case, it seems quite straightforward to see that the news media at the subnational level does have a strong potential for reinforcing existing developments. So if there are certain preferences or certain developments in a region, they are more likely to be reported about and potentially also more positively reported about in the regional or local news media, implying that people or the local population is more likely to develop a positive attitude towards that one, which again then is taken up uh, to present this uh, topic um, at an even higher frequency and even more positive sentiments, because that implies that sales of newspapers and 
uh, broadcasting will increase. So there's a strong potential for past dependent developments in there. From a policy perspective, however, it also means that there is a potential thing to, for instance, break certain development paths, right? So if some kind of uh, news or certain uh, preference or certain sentiments towards topics can be introduced into the circle, it may create a new type of narrative, a new type of relation between the news media and the local audience, which may then uh, eventually shape the behavior in a different way. But this is really then also some with some ethical considerations. Um, there's a lot to disentangle there. And I believe we're just at the very beginning of understanding this process in more depth. So let me sketch out a research agenda based on what I've said before, meaning that we do know news do have an impact. They do, they do matter economically. However, the existing research primarily looks at the national level and with all the things I mentioned before, US-centered and so on and so forth. And that we can um, quite safely assume, and some early works or some works that do show that already empirically, there is this regional dimension of news coming from the processes outlined before. The question is, where do we go from here? What could be next? So I would like to sketch a short research agenda. For instance, there is in, in geography in particular, a long tradition in thinking about regional identities, regional images. That is the idea, if we look, uh, live in a specific place long enough, we uh, develop a certain view of a region, we develop a certain identity or link to a specific uh, identity uh, that is present in a specific locality. There are uh, different layers to that. So that's a multi-layered uh, problem. You can have, of course, uh, be part of an identity of a local identity of let's say regional identity national identity and so on and so forth but there is clearly spatial variation in the degree to which people relate to their locality but also what this locality stands for and then the question is okay how do these views of a locality what locality stand for what type of um topics or type of, of keywords a place is related to, where does this come from? And here research has shown that indeed the media plays a strong role and can play a strong role in creating that, right? So for instance, if we think about this uh, fascinating debate we currently have on the places that don't matter um, in economic geography and regional science, to what extent is this, for instance, shared as an identity? To what extent has this found its way into the identity? And what role did the media and the presentation of these type of topics in the media played with respect to its emergence and its impact? Right? We do know at the national level, the influence of investment and location choices. A couple of years back when, for instance, in Germany's, you know, Germany, we saw the rise of, let's say, the far right in specific places. The, it was quite well debated in the news to what extent this may actually impact foreign direct investment. I don't know to what extent this has uh, been researched in detail, but it was already in the news discussing to what extent um, certain riots or protests in a region does have a direct economic consequence with respect to location choices of firms, subsidiaries, and so on. And very interesting then is uh, looking at these type of things also from a, um, uh, from a dynamic perspective over time. So what other places, for instance, are frequently referred to in, uh, in the news that you read in a specific region, that you listen to in a specific region? So maybe there are certain relationships established between uh, places, which is known also as news flows or information fields, that is certain places are mentioned more frequently or with respect to specific topics, with specific sentiments in places. In, in certain places. And then the question is, does this have uh, potential uh, influences on things like trade, or individuals' mobility, right? So if I read more frequently positive things about a certain place, for instance, about how well life is in cities, and I'm living in a peripheral region, does that make it more likely for me to consider moving there, right? Most likely it will. And this, of course, has direct economic consequences. Another topic is entrepreneurship, which I think uh, would greatly benefit from considering to a stronger degree 
um, to a stronger degree uh, what's happening in the news and what is presented in the news. It is, I think, known for long in this literature that entrepreneurship is very much benefiting from role models. So if, for instance, there is somebody you can look up to and is presented in a very positive way that has been acting as an entrepreneur, this will have a positive impact potentially on your choice of becoming an entrepreneur yourself or at least supporting these type of acti activities. And this also relates to, let's say, the economic risks that potentially entrepreneurs um, or that entrepreneurship is related to. So for instance, if I think about the German news media, which I do know for a certain degree, they're quite frequently entrepreneurs or managers are not presented in a very positive light, right? So they are equated with high salaries or, or gaining a lot of economic benefits and not so much it is discussed what they have risked, risked at a certain moment in life, for instance, and that things could have failed. You hardly see discussions in general about failed entrepreneurship in the news, other it is something that can be related to a specific politician, for instance. And this, of course, impacts the general perception of, the, uh, of entrepreneurship. And if we have this regional dimension in the news, I think it's not far-fetched to think about, okay, to what extent does this support, stir up, or help entrepreneurship in the place? Similarly related, this is, um, topic on place-based agency and leadership, right? So who become or who takes agency in a region? Who is leading the pack, so to speak? How does that emerge? To what extent is this supported or um, hindered by the media? How does policy can communicate with the media in order to get certain behavior and in, induced in places, I think is a very interesting thing to look at. Also in my in my field, that's the other field I'm usually more active in. Um, the idea, of course, goes back to already Hagerstrand and, and Rogers, uh, to what extent the acceptance and diffusion of innovation is uh, related to what's happening in the news, which places are reported, uh, report the first about a certain new technology, in what way it is reported about, to what extent is resistance to certain socioeconomic transformations be related to uh, news. So we have this topic, for instance, as I mentioned before, wind turbines, so this um, transition towards renewable energies. There are a lot of debates about that are featured in the, in the media and quite distinctively or quite differently between places. And uh, here it would be interesting to know more about to what extent this may actually have an impact on the outcome. In the world. So these are just some very, very broad ideas and questions I put forward where I believe uh, we can more or less immediately start working on this topic and we'll get some very interesting insights. Let me finish this presentation with a very preliminary conclusion because this is a, from, uh, from my perspective, rather novel um, research area. So I don't want to draw a conclusion yet, but a rather preliminary one. So there is still a, a lot of things to be explored or not still, there are a lot of things to be explored with respect to this topic. And this all starts from the idea that the regional news media is not just a one direction information channel to which everybody has equal access that is identical across places or that doesn't have this distinct regional dimension. So once we get over that idea, we see uh, many interesting research avenues, some of which I've outlined before emerging. And then there's really this idea to what extent the news media can, might be a key, in particular, mediating actor or, role, or playing a mediating role between regional socioeconomic uh, developments and individual behavior. As I outlined before, as I mentioned before, news serves as an input by, for instance, providing information perceptions, interpretation into certain regional economic developments. But it's of course also an outcome because it has to pick up on certain events that are, are reported about and present them in specific ways. Last but certainly not least, it is also an agent, right? It may have an own agenda. We do know certain news outlets uh, are closer related, let's say to the left-wing spectrum of the political agenda. Um, um, spectrum rather to the right wing. So there is uh, certainly a difference also in terms of what is the intention or the agency of these type of news media. So as soon as we move beyond seeing news as a mere information channel, but more as an 
actor or, or agent in these type of processes, we, uh, I think, come closer to understanding the role that news and regional news in particular can play in general for regional development processes. And this also implies that then we have to conceptualize the regional news process much more precisely than what I've done here in the very first draft, thinking about how, what is driving that, what are the direct impacts and the evolution over time, of course. And I want to close with the last slide by saying I did not mention that much about how to do these things empirically, but we have an entire um, session organized on that uh, matter um, here at the ERSA conference. So the ERSA session S17, present, there will be a number of very interesting empirical studies presented, also how to work with this data, what type of data is out there to disentangle some of the facts that uh, I've outlined here. Because one thing that is, some, is already clear and we already know, there is a strong regional variation in terms of frequency and sentiments with which certain events are presented. And below you see something uh, coming from a database I'm working on comparing the German average. Uh, that is the average sentiments, how positively or negatively the news are over time. Clearly see the outbreak of COVID for instance, which turned everything down. Um, in, in uh, July or June uh, 2020, uh, it really impacted the news strongly. But then you see this difference between Munich and Regensburg here, Munich being the blue uh, line, Regensburg the more positive line, uh, sorry, the, the, the green line uh, on top of it, showing that indeed there is some variation, not only in the general level of sentiments, meaning how positively news are in general, but also in the time dimension when certain developments take place or not. And with that, I would like to conclude and thank you very much for your um, patience. And look, I'm looking very much forward to your comments. And I already see a lot of questions popping up in the chat. Tom, thank you so much. Very interesting and uh, uh, exciting new research uh, ideas. Uh, I have uh, some questions. Uh, you know, your, your talk really, you know, brought out quite a few questions. I have some things I would like to ask, but let me jump quickly to the chat as the questions uh, have already started to come. Uh, first question from uh, Gunda Maya. How does the relationship between politician and journalists fit in there? Political journalists depend upon politicians to be informed about events, but politicians depend upon journalists to get their message through. At the regional and local level, this mutual dependence is typically stronger than at the national one. So how do you see this, this relationship you know, fitting into the picture you, 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 you build? I think it's, a, it's an excellent point. It is something um, that I find also um, with my own background, very interesting because it raises immediately the idea that there is regional variation in that, that is a link between the news media and politician. And for instance, this relates to, let's say the competitive structure of the local news market, right? So for imagine a region and some regions do exist like that, where you only have one media channel, one newspaper. Right? Most likely, this one is more prone to develop a very close link to uh, the local politicians, as uh, Gunther outlined. Um, and the situation might be totally different in more competitive news markets, right? So where you can also score highly by being uh, by opposing a certain uh, policy or certain politicians. So I think that's that's really interesting to to combine the two: economic market structure, competition in the news market and relation to local politicians. And on top of that, I think there might be other factors that explain potential variation in this link between the two, which is definitely an interesting factor to look at, absolutely. Can I please add one, one level of complexity here as well? Uh, news, news outlets, you know, always have some, you know, partisan bias on their news sources. How can we account for such a bias within a research framework? I think that's, that's very much an empirical question in the end, right? So um, firstly, there are, um, let's see, um, what's the English word for that? There, there are like, like catalogs of classifying the media into where would they belong? But there are more fascinating methods. So for instance, if you think about that in particular uh, countries, let's say you would know certain parties 
uh, certain political parties that are more related to the, uh, to the left wing or right wing or something like that, or two specific topics, you can, of course, identify them in, let's say, the news or the articles brought forward by a newspaper. Let's uh, stick to that example and then see whether this newspaper reports more positively or negatively in a more positive or negative light on whatever is related to these specific parties. And thereby, I think you can get a very nice indicator about where a, a newspaper stands. And maybe this changes over time, right? This doesn't need to be stable uh, or time invariant. So you can track that. But this is just one idea to go about, right? Once you know the, the political spectrum, you can identify also keywords. But I think parties make it quite easy, actually, because they have this abbreviation, which are usually um, quite easily identifiable in text analysis. So thereby, you can, uh, in principle, uh, develop such a spectrum or indicator putting uh, the news outlet on a specific um, point on that, in, in that political spectrum. Thank you. Uh, Gunda continues, and he says that uh, from our work on over-tourism, we learned that more media reports about over-tourism problems in, in a place usually attract more tourists and add to the problem. How could you account for that? I think that that's a wonderful example of what I mentioned before with this um, potential past dependent or let's say uh, past reinforcing development, right? So if the news media reports about a certain thing, like for instance here, uh, tourism in a specific place in a certain way, um, it may actually um, um, add to, if that uh, event is, uh, consists or uh, this process constitutes a problem, it may add to that. It may very much reinforce that. But on the other hand, and this is quite interesting, I think this is why, why Gunther poses this question is, even if the news media reports, let's say in a negative way, like over tourism, right? Um, it still has this, this uh, reinforcing pro, uh, uh, effect. And I think that's just fascinating because the question is, how is it then also interpreted by the reader, right? So one thing is, is written in the newspaper, it's presented in TV and so on, but how is it then actually perceived at the reader? So I think, and um, I, I think Evert Myers will tomorrow make this point. Um, even if something is reported in the news, it does not mean that this is really what's happening in a specific place or that it is perceived in the same way it is presented in the news, right? So news are not a mirror of reality. So even, and, and this creates this type of uh, process or this type of problems in certain, um, in, in certain circumstances or certain situations that Gunther alluded to. Great, thank you. Let me, let me move on to the next question from uh, Dimitris uh, Korpakis. Dimitris says, in the age of internet, one could conclude that the intensity of hyper-localized news can describe emerging leader regions in terms of innovation and growth. Could you comment on this, please? I think this is this is something where we have to be careful, right? Uh, because then really matters what do these news sources report about and how do they do that, right? So uh, in some of the empirical analysis we've, we've done and also we'll present tomorrow, it is really important to look at the uh, difference between how frequently certain topics pop up in the news. And usually it is the case the more um, and media outlets you have in a specific locality or that serve a specific local market, the higher the absolute number um, of news items on a specific topic. But then it really matters to look at, okay, but in what way is it presented? Is it presented positively and negatively? And just adding another uh, empirical complexity to that, um, it was something we also played around with. If you have a lot of local news media, it also means that on average, East each new media outlet will receive less attention, meaning newspapers will have less readership while broadcast stations will have uh, less listeners. So you have to account a little bit for the local market shares, right? The more uh, supply you have, the more it will be distributed or the population will distribute, uh, dist be distributed across these suppliers, meaning each news article, for instance, in the newspaper receives less attention, less readership, um, if you have a highly competitive news uh, market. Uh, thank you. Next question from uh, Taunting Wang. 
Um, the question is as follows. Would you please illustrate why regional news media is not one directional information channel? How do we get the response from newspaper readers? Yeah, that's, uh, I think that, that really uh, that captures a couple, of the thing, a couple of the things I mentioned before. So of course we could simply look at news and saying, okay, there's something presented Let's stick to this example of newspapers. Some topic is discussed, some event is presented. But the point is that this is not independent or the probability that this event is reported in the newspaper, in the local newspaper, is not independent of this locality. Take the extreme example, right? So if I have a region, for instance, without a soccer club, I have no idea whether such a region exists, but just to make an example. So if there is no soccer club, quite likely you will not see a lot of reporting about a soccer club uh, in the newspapers. In contrast, if you have a region with a very successful uh, soccer club, there might be entire sections of the newspaper devoted to that particular soccer club, providing more possibilities for the reader to read about the specific topic and to form an opinion on more information, but also potentially in a very specific way, meaning rather positive way than in a region that has no local soccer club, so to speak, and also the media has no um, has no need really to take this topic uh, on board in order to serve the preferences or demand of the local audience. Just one example I mentioned more before. Uh, another question from uh, Stefano Aragona. The problem is that if a fact, and fact is with a quotation mark, is not seen, it does not exist. And it is a question very relevant for democracy and not only for the space issue. So I was wondering if this is something you could uh, uh, comment upon. No, absolutely. And I think um, obviously the news media has been in the interest of political scientists, sociologists for a long time. And I think there it is really a big thing to look at now amplified maybe even with social media. So um, I don't want to take anything away from that. To the contrary, I'm just saying what the argument is that I'm making is in particular our field that I would say our field, whatever that is, but regional science and economic geography uh, has a stronger interest, let's say, in the economic impact or the economic relevance of a news as a factor, as it may be also an agent in this um, um, economic and economic processes. And I think that's where I want to go with this topic is really if we look from this economic a point of view at the sub-national uh, scale, what extent can understanding news help us then learn more at what, to what extent can understanding news help us get a better idea about what's happening economically? How can we explain developments on that basis? So that's really where I think um, the merits lie. Well, I'm going to keep on going with the questions. They are still coming. Uh, Tom, if you want to have a sip of water, go for it. <laughs> Uh, a question from uh, Daniele Mantecasi. Related to what, said, to what you said before on the media not being the mirror of reality, an important aspect to consider is also represented by fake news and decisional distribution. Do you think that this is something that you know, can fit into that uh, uh, framework? Absolutely. And I think it's, it's one of the hot topics also that is much more discussed right now in political science and sociology or, or journalism studies as well, how to identify also empirically fake news and what impact does it have. And I think here from, uh, on the, in the, in, from the perspective of the presentation I've given, the first question that pops up is, is there a regional dimension to fake news? right? What are social economic conditions in specific places? What are the conditions in the local news market that make the likelihood that the general audience is confronted with fake news more likely or less likely? And one of the things um, that is discussed in Germany, for instance, is a thing called one newspaper district, districts being not three regions. And the idea is that there are localities in, in Germany that are only served by one particular newspaper. And in many cases, and in some cases, not many cases, in some cases, this local newspaper has a very strong bias and may be actually quite prone to present fake news, right? And then just by being located in that region, it makes it 
not impossible, but at least more difficult to look for other types of information sources and to not be confronted with these fake news. So I think that's a very interesting research question to look at. Also, you know, what explains the spatial variation? To what extent does it exist? And then, of course, does it have an impact in an economic sense, for instance, or social as well, right? Um, and another one, uh, another suggestion from uh, Marco Bellanti. Um, Marco says, I would suppose that if possible in terms of data collection, it could be interesting also to look at advertising associated with local news. How much of it is related to local business and what does it tell about the features of local business? It's, it's a good point. Um which the problem is if we would talk about the empirical side of how to, to collect news data, how to analyze it, how to localize it, I think that would be a keynote in itself. Um, and again, I can only uh, very much invite you to the special session where I, but also Ebert uh, Myers will talk a little bit about these things, what to consider, what not to consider, what type of experiences are there, what type of data you can actually access and I like this idea of, of looking for advertisement. It depends then on whether your type of data collection uh, includes this type of advertisement. But it's definitely a very interesting um, thing to look at. Again, from an empirical point of view, you need to have the data. You need to know what to look for uh, and consider certain aspects, which we will discuss tomorrow at a much greater length. Looking forward to your presence there in the session. I think we will all be into that session. Um... I have another comment for Gunta Maya. Gunta says, I think fake news within quotation marks is not the right term. More important, maybe controversial, controversial news, which may be fake or not, but generates audience, uh, audience interest. True. I mean, uh, we can discuss how we name these things. And I think controversial news, in contrast to fake news, at least from my interpretation, implies that I can have a different opinion about it. So it is very much how I perceive of the topic that is discussed or the way it is presented in the news that can be controversial from my perspective. Whereas, for instance, fake news are much more defined along the idea that really something is presented wrongly or the wrong or facts are made up. Right. So I would say there's a qualitative difference, and therefore I think you can use both terms, depending a little bit on the context. Um, but indeed, uh, you, you mentioned this point of controversy, and I think that's really um, the interesting fact about this news um, information, but also studying news, that we do have these debates that we do not only see one side of the thing, but also may have the possibility to study an opposing side. So just uh, to give a, an example um, where we can't do that, and I think you're also going to are familiar with this type of research, think about patents, right? We, we kind of see the successful inventions or innovations in the end. And we don't observe all the controversy leading to that, or we don't see uh, the things that did not happen. Right. And in the news, I think you have, and this was also a reason why I looked into this type of data to begin with, you have these controversies. So where things are not yet decided and where you see arguments or perceptions of specific events from different perspectives also develop, developing over time. Sounds fascinating, is of course empirically extremely hard to deal with. But I think that that's, makes it so fascinating. So I want to thank you. This was a super exciting session uh, and we're all looking forward for the tomorrow special session. Last question for you, what time is the session tomorrow? That's a, a catch question, right? Uh, I think, let me, let me just check. Uh, 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 you well, do know it? Sorry, I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> it's, no, it's at 10, 10 a.m. 10 a.m., right? 10, 10 a.m. tomorrow. Thank you so yeah. much. Looking it was forward. great to listening to you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And looking forward to see you all there.